Any war is going to have terrible consequences for civilians, but the way that the Russians have conducted themselves in this conflict in particular has been incredibly harmful and devastating to the civilian population. We've seen currently more than 18 million Ukrainians in need of humanitarian assistance. Nearly 8 million have fled the country to other parts of Europe and beyond, and more than 5 million are internally displaced. Tens of thousands of civilians have been killed and countless more injured, both physically and mentally. One of the most shocking crimes that the Russians are accused of is the forcible transfer of population from Ukraine into Russia. Just in recent weeks, we saw a report from Yale University that documented the transfer of 6,000 Ukrainian children out of Ukraine and into Russian re-education camps, some as far as 500 miles from the Ukrainian border. And if done with the intent to destroy Ukrainian culture and these children's Ukrainian identity, then that constitutes not just a war crime, but could also also constitute an act of genocide. The International Criminal Court launched an investigation into war crimes and other crimes in Ukraine within days of the Russian invasion, and that has evolved to the largest investigation the ICC has ever undertaken, with an unprecedented level of international support. The Ukrainian prosecutor has estimated that he has evidence of more than 65,000 individual war crimes that have taken place over the last year. The ICC will only prosecute a tiny fraction of those crimes. The rest will be left to the Ukrainians themselves to try and prosecute in their domestic courts, and some number of trials that will take place probably throughout Europe. When it became clear the scale of atrocities being committed in Ukraine, a number of European countries got together to form a joint investigatory team to reconcile and deconflict their own efforts to investigate war crimes and crimes against humanity in Ukraine. And those efforts will probably result in a number of domestic prosecutions in countries throughout Europe for crimes committed in Ukraine. One of the things that's been astonishing about the Ukrainian justice system is that it's continued to operate throughout this conflict. This is a rare situation where, in the midst of war, the justice system is functional enough to not only collect evidence and preserve evidence, but actually undertake prosecutions. They have the unique ability to secure defendants as they are capturing Russians on the battlefield, where they're able to document crimes, they're able to bring them to justice immediately. The speed at which the international community and the Ukrainian system have moved to document and actually start to prosecute abuses has been incredibly surprising. And it's facilitated by the fact that you have the full support of the Ukrainian government for both domestic and international prosecutions. There are many lessons learned that I think the international human rights and criminal law community will take from this conflict. One is the need for really strong, robust international coordination on investigations and prosecutions. The cooperation that has happened and the mechanisms for doing that, I think, will set precedent for future situations where you have this level of interest and attention. More challenging will be the question of whether the level of support we've seen, for example, from the United States for these investigations and prosecutions transfers to other conflicts. The support that the U.S. has expressed for the ICC on a bipartisan basis for this conflict, I hope will crack open the door to further cooperation with the ICC in other countries and other contexts. But it remains to be seen whether that goodwill and that trust that they are placing in the ICC will extend further.